Open your Bibles to Matthew 13. We'll be starting in verse 44 and going to verse 46. And after you get that, for extra credit, put your thumb there and flip over to 16, verse 24. And we'll be going from 24 to 28 there. So two passages that we're mainly going to be considering this morning. Matthew 13, 44 to 46 and 16, 24 to 28. Well, the American church has an embarrassment of riches. We have religious freedom. We can feel free to come together as a church body and practice, really, actually, any religion we choose, we could do that in this country and not be fearful of some sort of reprisal from our government. It's a privilege that few in this world have, and, and perhaps it's growing rarer, maybe even in this country, but nevertheless, we have it as American Christians. We have a wealth of Christian resources at our fingertips. As we speak, all the majority of doctrinally solid Christian book publishers are headquartered in this country. And an overwhelming majority of doctrinally solid resources, riches, treasure troves of information are at our fingertips. And all of these resources, they can be bought at local bookstores or perhaps they can be bought online. They could even be downloaded to your phone instantaneously. That's not to mention the fact that we've got a Bible in our own language. Whatever version of that Bible we really want. We've got it in our language. And we can access probably all of them on our phones. We have churches on every corner, and this is predominant, obviously, in the South. But if you're talking from a global perspective, even places up north have churches on every corner compared to what is available globally. There's even churches that cater towards particular likes and whims and fancies of Christians. Now, I'm not saying that's how you should look for a church at all. But I'm just saying that in our country, it is there. We have a wealth of access to theological training. I know people who are retired, who got seminary degrees just to improve their quiet time. You may think that's crazy, but it's available to you. The average Baptist Sunday school attendee, not teacher, attendee, has more theological training than the average African pastor. We have countless resources, and yet many in our pews remain biblically illiterate. How is that possible? A regular attendee in church attends church two out of every five Sundays. According to a 2017 Barna study, 52% of practicing Christians strongly agree that the Bible teaches God helps those who help themselves. Now, statistically, half of you in here went, doesn't it? Almost three in ten practicing Christians strongly agree that all people pray to the same God or Spirit no matter what name they use for that spiritual being. Three out of ten. Now, if that's not enough, Barna estimates that roughly 70% of high school students who enter college as professing Christians will leave with little to no faith. These students usually don't return to their faith even after graduation as Barna projects that 80% of those reared in the church will be quote-unquote disengaged by the time they're 29. 
And I might add, just anecdotally, if I could maybe update Barna from just observation. How about that? That I think when the Barna studies start coming out about the impact of the pandemic on American churches, it will probably explain a lot of the tragedy that we feel as we see many adults now leaving our churches across America. So that raises the question, with all the supposed advantages that we have in this country, why are so many so-called Christians disappearing from churches? Many of them, remember, we baptized. Many of them made quote-unquote decisions for Christ. And now, some of these individuals are leaving churches across America never to darken the door of a church ever again. How do we explain this? Well, to answer that question, we need to understand how the Bible, and specifically the Gospel of Matthew, ex- defines what a Christian actually is. So as I said, we've been summarizing the Gospel of Matthew, where we, before we had spent about three and a half years taking the Gospel of Matthew verse by verse and passage by passage, and now we're looking to take all of those things that Matthew has shown us and actually apply them both to our congregation and to us as individuals in our church. As we seek to apply all of those things taught in the book of Matthew, We need to understand what it means to be a Christian and how Matthew helps us to understand that much more clearly, which will then help us as a church body and us as individual Christians better define what our purpose is, whether it be as we raise our children, as we engage our family members in the world around us, maybe as we engage our neighbors. So then I ask the question, what does it mean To be truly converted. What is true conversion as defined by the Scripture? Let's see how Jesus defines it first here in Matthew 13, 44-46, and then in 16, 24-28. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now in 16, 24-28. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn to consider your word, we need your help to understand. So many things in your word are are clearly written, clearly stated, and yet difficult for us to understand sometimes. All of that lies inside our own hearts. Obstacles and impediments that keep us from seeing the truth of Your Word, and I pray that You would remove all of those now by Your Spirit, that You would illuminate the text in front of us. Each one of us have different things that are going on in our lives that I can't possibly know the depths of, but You do. And so I pray that as it comes to the applying of Your Word to the lives of Your people, that You would preach a sermon far better than I can. 
you would apply deep down into the deep crevices of our hearts so that we might see your word clearly and obey it joyfully. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, these two passages are two of the more pivotal passages in the entire Gospel of Matthew. They're, they're helpful in clarifying what Jesus is actually explaining to his disciples. And you'll remember that in the middle of this run in Matthew, especially in Matthew 13, but also in 16, and that whole section of Matthew, Jesus is really setting forward what it looks like to be one of his disciples. And he's clarifying for a host of people, it does not mean this and it does mean this. Because he's got several people, many people, who are gathered around because they're seeing his miracles. They're watching him do all of these great things. And they're, they're hooked. They're ready. I, I want to follow. But they don't yet clearly understand what it means to actually be a disciple. And so what does it mean to be so impacted by the kingdom that Jesus is bringing that I would want to follow him in this way. And so the first passage from Matthew 13 is in the context of Jesus defining two types of people in this world. Two types of people that receive this gospel message in two different ways. The first group dis- receives the, the preaching of the kingdom of heaven and they receive it joyfully, and they grow, and they continue to be in it, and they endure the Father's judgment. And yet there is another group who do not endure the Father's judgment when Christ returns, but are rejected and thrown into hell. And he's laying those two groups out in Matthew chapter 13. And so the kingdom of heaven, he says, and those welcomed into it, is essentially, ultimately, the destiny of those who receive the word and the gospel message joyfully and they submit to Christ's rule and his reign and they grow under it and therefore inherit eternal life. So in verse 44 of chapter 13, Jesus puts it out there pretty plainly so that we can understand. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which man found and covered up and went and sold all that he had. To buy the field. So this man finds his treasure, he covers it up immediately, and it says in his joy, he is so excited about it that he runs off and he sells all that he has to buy the field. Now the interpretation for this parable and the one about the pearls that follows right after it is not really as difficult as people often make it out to be. Because... If you just keep reading in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus actually encounters someone later on where he takes this parable and he just drops it in his lap. And it plays out right there in plain sight for everybody. There's this scene where a rich young man comes before Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And it's in Matthew 19. Verse 21 to 22, Jesus' response to him. He says to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, in the parable, it plays out a little differently. Because the man, in his joy over the treasure that he's found, goes and sells all that he has and possesses the treasure. In this one, the man is sorrowful because it doesn't turn out the same way that it does in the parable. So the parable that Jesus tells after the treasure in the field is the one with the pearls. The merchant who is in search of fine pearls comes and he finds one of great value and again sells all that he has and to buy the pearl of great price. And we know that those two parables have the same interpretation Mainly because, right there at the beginning of verse 45, what does Jesus say? Again. Meaning, I told it to you once, now I'm going to tell you again. So we know that the two have the same interpretation. So the question is, what happens to the person who is in unbelief? If we're to understand that the meaning of this parable is that someone stumbles upon this offer of salvation... 
which Jesus here calls the kingdom of heaven, he stumbles upon this offer of salvation, understands it in light of his sin. What, what does this person do? What is the response to someone who is truly converted, who hears the gospel message preached? What is their reaction? Someone comes along sowing the seeds of the gospel, telling them the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. Tells them about forgiveness of sin, about eternal life that can be theirs. What is it that they have found here in the dirt? How, how do we understand what this person is really thinking when they come upon that message of the gospel? When Jesus illustrates that these men find these treasures, either the treasure hidden in the dirt or the pearl in the merchant shop, they not only find forgiveness of sin, but they find reconciliation with the God of the universe, don't they? This is what they're hearing in the gospel message. You, sinner, you can be forgiven of your sin. You can be reconciled to the God of the universe. And in that, they hear a totally new way of living, a radical transformation that's being offered to them. They find a totally new way of thinking. A set of values that kicks out the old values and brings in an entirely new set of values. They find, they find a transformation of their very nature. All of the things that they love and they value before have gone away. And you can see that in this man. What does he do? He goes and sells all that he has. Does he do it begrudgingly? That's not what he says. He says, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. The premise of all of this is simple. You and I aren't born inside the kingdom of God. You and I are born on the outside, looking in through the window of the kingdom of God. And we're seeing all of the people inside the kingdom of God who have received the message of the gospel this way, joyfully, we're born looking in the window at them, receiving this joyfully. And maybe your testimony has been that as an adult, you came to a church service, and you saw people singing songs, or heard people singing songs, that you didn't fully understand. And you looked around at the joy on their faces, and you didn't totally understand that either. And you saw maybe the tears coming from their eyes as they sang these songs. And you thought to yourself, I don't understand why they're doing that. This is you being born on the outside of the kingdom of God, looking in at a group of people who are celebrating God's rule and His reign and submitting to King Jesus and saying all these things and reading from these scriptures that you don't really grasp. You're on the outside of the kingdom looking in. They're in there reconciled in their relationship to God. They're bowing before God. They're living by His rule and His reign. But by default, we are not born in that situation. We're born on the outside looking in. Before Christ, we are enemies of the state, you understand. If we were to bre breach the gates of the kingdom of heaven and walk in, we would be shot on sight, prosecuted for our sin. Guilty before the judge and given the death penalty. But the miracle of salvation that these people have found in the dirt standing before them is that God, knowing that you and I could never walk into the gates of the kingdom of heaven on our own merit. We could never, ever stand. God, instead of leaving us in that position, sent His own Son outside of the kingdom, out into the world, to go out into the domain of darkness where you and I live, and there suffer the wrath that you and I deserve. So that after this, after His death, His burial, His resurrection from the dead, you and I could be saved, redeemed, forgiven of all of our sin, 
and walk into the gates of the kingdom of heaven, not as condemned sinners, but as sons and daughters of the king. This is the gospel message. And what, how is that received? By faith. By trust. That you walk into the kingdom of heaven not under your own merit, but strictly by what Christ has done for you. All of your righteous deeds, they could not be heaped up high enough to allow you to walk into the kingdom of heaven on your own merit. It's strictly by faith in His death on our behalf that we're able to go in. That you and I are not sentenced to death. So when the kingdom of heaven is rightly understood, when you understand where you stand on the outside of the gates as a condemned sinner, and you understand that it is by God's grace and mercy alone that you are able to, to be welcomed at His table as a son or daughter, it is strictly by the work of Christ on your behalf. When you grasp that, and when your eyes have been opened to actually see what it is that Christ has provided for you, you don't see it as just another trinket, but as a treasure in the dirt. You see it as a pearl on the shelf that apparently no one else has seen the value of. That immediately, all of the things in your life pale by comparison to possessing this treasure. It is the only thing of importance and permanence. Because in this, in this alone, do I have eternal life. If I had all the rest of this stuff, and I didn't have that, I would die as a sinner condemned whether I was the richest man on earth or the poorest, what would it gain me if I forfeited my soul? So when you understand it this way, when you understand that this is reconciliation with the God of the universe that's being offered to you, this is salvation, this is forgiveness of sin, this is not coming in sheepishly, this is not coming in cowardly. This is not coming in and, and begrudgingly. This is not God saying, all right, fine, you can stay. But if I hear a peep out of you, this is not that. This is being changed from enemy of the state to son or daughter. With the God of the universe. When that is understood, then what happens is you understand the real value of what's being offered to you. And everything else pales by comparison. So if that's what these men find, or these people in the parable find, what does Jesus say that a truly converted person does who truly finds this gift of eternal life? Well, first of all, he immediately understands that it's more valuable than all the other things in life that he could possess. And that if he lost everything else in life, but he gained this gift, it would be worth it. Paul says it this way in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You understand, you see, Paul and Jesus are speaking the same language about salvation. You get that? In Matthew 13, 44-46, Jesus is describing a person who is truly changed by the gospel. They've heard the good news of salvation of, uh, in Christ alone. And he says that, that one who has experienced true conversion sees the promise of eternal life as infinitely more valuable than anything that might hold them back from following Jesus. And then flash forward now to Philippians 3, 7, and 8 where we have the testimony of Paul the Apostle. 
who was on the road to Damascus, having persecuted the church before and going to persecute the church now in Damascus, sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He's blinded on the road, and a few days later he regains his sight and was baptized. Why was it that he left his previous life as a Pharisee and a persecutor of the church to follow Christ? He says here in Philippians 3, because he counted everything as loss by comparison to the surpassing worth of the treasure that he found in the field. Doesn't it seem as though Paul is describing his own conversion in the same way that Jesus is describing the conversion of someone in Matthew 13, 44-46, someone who is really his disciple. Yet some of us, when we read what Paul says here in Philippians, or maybe when we read Jesus in Matthew 13, it, it feels foreign to us. Maybe just a little bit foreign to us. Like maybe these two passages are describing professional Christianity. We're maintaining our amateur status so we can Christian in the Olympics or something. That that is a level of Christianity I'll never get to. That's the professional ranks. Wow, maybe, maybe one day with enough practice I could attain that level of Christian. It's obvious that we think that, that we've been taught that a number of times particularly in the American church, because many years ago, we opted, and I don't say we as Emmanuel, I mean we as church across this, churches across this country, opted to teach easy believism instead of what it actually means to follow Jesus. We opted to teach easy believism way of following Jesus instead of how the Bible actually teaches what it means to be a disciple, a true convert of Christianity, someone who actually believes in Jesus. We manufactured a prayer that someone could pray and we, made our, we converted our aisles into a thing that someone could walk down in order to be saved in spite of that being nowhere in the Bible. We just made it out of whole cloth. I got an idea. If I want to make it really easy for you to come to Jesus, I'll just open up an aisle and I'll just tell you what words to sprinkle over your life so that in that one time, momentary time, you can make a decision. And to top it off, we would say about those who have done that and then left the church never to darken the door of the church ever again. Well, at least we know they're Christians and they'll be in heaven because I remember that one time when they prayed the prayer and walked the aisle. I remember that time when they made a decision. And our reasoning is sometimes even taken from misconstrued words of Paul in Romans 10, 9-11, where he says, If you confess your with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. See? Some will say. It's right there in the text of Scripture. We just need to ask, do you believe it? If they say yes, and we say, will you confess it? And they say yes, that's what praying the prayer is. Then you're saved, they might say. So that person we know, maybe even someone very close to us, maybe even people within our own family, they walk the aisle, they prayed some prayer we told them to pray, they got dunked in front of a room full of strangers, and we called them saved, and we still believe it to this day, in spite of the fact that there is absolutely not one shred of evidence in their life that they ever truly believed. But we never stop to ask in Romans 10, what Paul means when he says, believe. 
Is that what it means to believe? To believe in Jesus, all that is required is walking an aisle and saying something one time to a room full of strangers and getting in a bathtub in front of them. Is, and then walking out, and you don't ever have to darken the door of a church again. You don't have to give any evidence of the fact that you continue to believe. Is that all that is required to be a Christian? That is easy believism. And it permeates the walls of almost every church in this country. It's false. What does Paul mean when he says, believe? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, if the rest of the Bible is any indication, and if Paul himself in Philippians is any indication, to believe is more than merely making a decision one day. To believe. To experience true conversion. One's entire value system is completely upended to such an extent that all things that previously held value pale by comparison to what is gained in Jesus. He's discovered a treasure hidden in a field and he sold everything that he has to possess it. Have you ever asked... Why does Paul in Romans 10 mandate someone confess with their mouth? You ever thought about that? Well, why isn't it good enough that I just believe in my heart? What's with the confessing with the mouth? Sounds awful lot like works-based righteousness, right? If I confess with my mouth and all of a sudden sprinkle some dust on it, I'm saved? Why does he mandate that it be confessed? I think if you shared the gospel in Iran, you would immediately get why confession with the mouth that Jesus is Lord is such a big deal. Confessing with the mouth that you're a follower of Jesus actually costs you something in almost every place in this world historically, saying Jesus is Lord from a heart that is truly convinced that what you found in the dirt is far better than anything that could be had in this life, including my own life, actually costs you something. So those who've experienced true conversion... And what they find in the treasure in Christ causes them to see that even if they were to kill me, even if they were to put me to death right now, they would only usher me into life. How could you possibly threaten an individual whose heart believed that? How could you possibly keep them quiet from saying Jesus is Lord even under the most dire circumstances, even when they knew their own life was on the line, if they truly believed that death only ushered them into life, you couldn't. So then, when you put this passage next to Jesus defining discipleship in Matthew 16, verse 24, it makes sense that he would define discipleship this way. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would lose, would save his life, will lose it. Whoever would, would look at his life and the treasures that he possesses and would say, I, I, I can't lose this. I have to hold on to this. The pleasures and the gratification of this life are far more important than, than anything else I could have. I have to hold on to it. The one who would seek to save his life in that way will lose it. He's going to die. And hell is going to be the outcome. He's going to lose it all. But whoever loses his life for my sake 
running off in joy, selling all your possessions, giving up all of those things that are the most dear to you because they cost you following Christ, will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Do you see why Jesus defines discipleship this way? Because this is what it means to be converted. Jesus is not describing professional Christianity. Paul is not describing professional Christianity. They are laying out what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be genuinely converted. You will find adults, when we wrap our minds around that, that place the date of our salvation much later on in life. When this became a reality for us. This is not professional Christianity. Paul comes to the point where he says, I count everything as loss. Everything in my life could disappear instantaneously. But if I had Christ, it would be worth it. He says just a couple of chapters earlier, another verse that often confuses us, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Even the worth of his own life is only valued in relationship to what it means to do ministry on behalf of Christ now or to die and be with Christ later. That is what my life is worth right there. Ministry for Christ or living with Christ. So then I want to ask, what happens in a church when we understand conversion this way? When corporately as a church, we embrace true biblical conversion as it's laid out here by Jesus or by Paul? Well, for one, genuine worship. Genuine worship is what happens. The members of the church aren't merely people who walked down an aisle, prayed a prayer, and were baptized and given the title member, but then turn and backbite and gossip and slander and tear down every person that they come in contact with. The members of the church are people who have found the treasure in a field. And they know what it's worth. The members of the church then, in a worship service, stop merely singing words on a screen. They start singing about their treasure. Church, what changes about your singing? When it comes from a heart who has found its treasure, how does your singing change? The people stop evaluating worship based on personal preferences and now on how accurately their treasure was described in singing, in Scripture, in the prayers that were prayed and in the sermon that was preached. That's the value of the worship service. You, you, you evaluate it not based on, hey, that was pretty good. Hey, that was... Songs are slower than I like them to be. They were too fast. I didn't sing the real ones that I know. I, I, I know a lot of other ones that are, that are better than those. That's no longer the evaluative process. Now it is how accurately does what was said up there and sung from up there reflect what I know to be true of this treasure that I have found The members of the church guard the gospel. That's what is entrusted to you as members of the church, members of the body of Christ, those who have found the treasure in the dirt. You guard the gospel. 
And so when it comes to admitting people into membership, how do you evaluate their membership in the body of Christ? Have they found the same treasure that I've found? When they describe their testimony, does it sound like someone who has found a treasure in a field, or does it sound like someone who's describing something that they were always told but have never experienced? We dismiss people, should the need arise, who demonstrate anything less than they have found a treasure hidden in a field. They have found a pearl of great value. The members of the church desire accountability that comes with following Jesus. They desire to be exhorted toward holiness. I want to grow in understanding this treasure that I've found. I want to grow in chewing on the tough stuff of Scripture. Because even the pain that comes through conviction of the Word being read or preached or taught or whatever... Even that pain, I know, is just the chipping away of all of the desires that would seek to hold on to all the things that I have rather than allow me to enjoy, go and sell everything that I have so that I may follow Christ. So then we live in this delicate balance where sin is no longer tolerated and that we can confront it with holy confrontation but also on the other side, that grace and mercy are extended routinely. Why? Because I remember what it's like to stumble upon this treasure that I didn't deserve. That I found this field just like you did. The confrontation of sin is one beggar showing another beggar Where to find bread? Because I remember the grace and mercy that were given to me on the cross. How could I possibly hold your sins against you? How could I possibly withhold forgiveness? So then what you see is that the back door of the church begins to close. It'll never close completely as long as sin is a part of this world. You understand. But you see that back door of the church begin to close a little bit because the front door of the church now sets a standard for believing in Christ, not merely as you can say some words and repeat after me. Your heart has been changed. So what happens when you individually, not just as a church, but you individually, Embrace the Scripture's teaching on what it means to be saved. First of all, you'll stop seeing everyone around you as saved. You'll stop seeing people around you that you've grown up with and known all your life because they grew up in the South and they can say all of the same Bible words that you can say. You'll stop seeing everyone as being saved. And you'll begin to realize that the path really is wide that leads to destruction. And the believism is easy that leads to hell. But the path and doorway that lead to life are narrow. And few find it. Second, you'll actually see the need to share the gospel even with people that tell you they are Christian. If we know that it's not because you just walked an aisle or prayed a prayer, you'll realize that your mission field is probably very near to you. It's probably with people you already know, people in your own family, maybe even your sons and daughters. And you'll realize that your mission field is not simply out there, but it might be on the pew sitting next to you. Third, you'll stop setting the bar for salvation for your children as merely that they pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart, which is also nowhere found in Scripture. Instead, you'll set before them a treasure that is eternal life. A treasure that makes all other treasures, even their own lives, 
pale by comparison. A treasure that bids them to come and die, die to their own preferences, their own trinkets, their own desires. But what they find on the backside is an all-satisfying treasure in Christ. And He's a Savior who may take them to a faraway country, and He may have them literally lay down their own lives for the sake of the Gospel. He may have them give up a seven-figure salary so that they can raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord rather than being an absentee parent. He may have them confess their own sins before the most important people in their lives. He may have them do a billion different self-sacrificing things over the course of their life. But you know they'll happily do it because they, what they actually found in the field is worth way more than a seven-figure salary. It's worth more than their reputation. It's worth more than their own life. But parents, be warned. They're going to follow whichever Jesus you put before them. They're going to follow whichever one you tell them. If you give them the, easy, the Jesus of easy believism, there is a high likelihood that they're going to be shocked and appalled when they get into college and their professor and their fellow students mock them for believing in a talking snake. When they actually come to a decision where they have to deny premarital sex, where they have to deny their own impulses, where they have to deny drunkenness, when they're confronted with a life of holiness on one side or doing whatever they want, according to Barna, statistically, seven out of ten of them are going to opt to do whatever they want because they were told believing in Jesus is a low bar. It means virtually nothing. I can have Jesus and all this other stuff too. That's what I was told when I walked that aisle. But if you're going to set before them a Jesus, which is a treasure, that bids you come and die, that wants to see you sell everything you own and follow Him, get rid of any impediment to following Him, They have to see you willing to do the same thing. They have to see you hold your own life loosely. Then, the Jesus that's worth more than fine gold will be the only Jesus they ever know. And that's not a guarantee that they're going to follow. But if they do, you may not know what, where that life is going to take them. You may not know where they're going to go in their life, but you can be assured what the outcome is going to be. Because they've given up everything to follow. That's something, true conversion, that they'll never lose. That's what we as a church want to embrace. That's what the Bible teaches Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray again for our children. I pray for our parents. As we lay before them a treasure hidden in a field, that we might expose it, we might uncover the dirt, that we might give this to them and that they might take it and follow. Lord, open the eyes of our children. Open the eyes of my children. that they would see the value of following Christ. That they would see it lived out in their father, in their mother. That they would earnestly desire to have it for themselves. Father, avail yourself to them. When they pray, hear their prayers. When they cry out to you, answer them. Show them 
the God that I know, who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, rich in mercy. May they see it in me. Jesus' name.